If you will, go ahead and start turning over to- towards the uh, book of Micah. If you're not very familiar with that in my Bible, that would be page 1104. That'll get you close. Probably don't spend a lot of time reading from the book of Micah. Uh, when John was up here, Brother John read from 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, and there in verse 2 it says, Moreover, it is required in a steward that they be found faithful. We focused in on that a little bit, and certainly it is logical and it is biblical when you begin to talk about the stewards of Christ or His followers. But how many of you have ever had somebody ask you, well, what is really required of a Christian in the first place? Or what, what does God even require of us to become a Christian? There is so much when we begin to talk about becoming Christians or living as Christians. And so I think the majority of us have probably been in a conversation with somebody where you're discussing what is it that God really re- requires of man? Or you've been spending time studying with someone and you're trying to teach them that there are certain things required. Now, again, I don't have to go back. We've already found in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, he says that it is required that, and he goes on, that stewards are faithful. We can look at a number of verses that talk about the requirements either to become a Christian or to be a Christian. So I am going to focus a little bit on that today, primarily on that word uh, required. Uh, But before we do that, let's go into Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And the reason I chose this, certainly this was uh, addressed to those who were Jews at the time, prior to Christianity coming into effect. But we get something from uh, verse 8 there. Sorry, verse, uh, verse 8. Follow along with me. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Verse 8, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. The prophet here, Micah, as he is addressing really the requirements for those who are followers of God, he doesn't try to go back and and list every single thing. But what he does is is he both asks a question and then he gives the answer. And basically the question was this, what what does the Lord God require of us? And then he begins to give the answer. He says, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. So this morning what I want to do is I really want to ask the same question that the prophet Micah did, but I want to change it up just a little bit because uh, as Christians we're followers of Christ. So let's ask the question, what is it that Jesus really requires of man and woman today? Now that's a very large question, and certainly I can't give all of that in one sermon. I'd like to, but I really know that I can't, and you probably wouldn't tolerate me that long. But what does Jesus require of us? That certainly is probably the most beneficial question we can ask. And so we're going to begin to break that down and cover as much as we can this morning. And again, if you're here, you can follow along on the outline. Uh, I'll be pretty close to following that. I might add some as I go, so be prepared to write in verses. Let's start off looking at the requirements. Really, what is it that Jesus requires for all men and women? Well, we're going to notice if we begin to look through our scriptures that one of the most important things that we could actually try to teach somebody else is simply this. Jesus commanded everybody everywhere to become a disciple. Now, for those of us who are Christians, I think that we would say we have an understanding that this is probably one of the very most foundational principles that anybody could even take from the New Testament. Certainly we understand that this was commanded by Christ. And what's interesting is he does this in a way really as a gentle invitation and yet, as we, we begin, go ahead and turn over to Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 30. As we begin to look at this command, we also see uh, the sincere request for really all men to be saved. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, verse 30, Jesus is quoted as saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let me pause for one second. That word come, we understand that is a command. Jesus was one who was in a position of authority, and he says, Come unto me. First command. Verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Let me pause again. He requires those who would come unto him to take this yoke. Again, another command. And then he says, And learn of me. 
Again, we have, we have always understood that the Christian, uh, the Christian understanding pertaining to our faith has always been a very intellectual-based uh, religion. Christianity is something that we can sit down, we can look at, we can understand who gave the commands, what was expected of the commands, and what is the outcome of those obedient to the commands. You see a heavy, heavy focus on that word learn and teach throughout our New Testament. But he goes on and he says, For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Very simply, he says in those commands, come and he says, take, and he says, learn. And I could go on and I could give so many different verses talking about Jesus commanding those to become disciples. Now, certainly we understand this. That's left up to man's free will. You can either become a disciple of Christ or you can reject it. But that is the expectation for all of those who are followers of God and believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And so as we begin to look at this earnest plea with man, given in the request of a command, or given in the form of a command, we understand this. As he says to come and to take and to learn, we understand the very first thing as far as somebody becoming a Christian really is simply uh, being taught and then being willing to obey the teachings of Christ. You can't get any more fundamental than that. And obedience for the non-Christian will culminate in the act of being baptized, more specifically for the remission of your sins. I'm going to go over to Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19, because we're talking about Jesus' command to be disciples. And so again, we'll look at Jesus' words. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Again, you see the commands there. Go, teach, Baptized. That's what Jesus is commanding the apostles. Okay? That is very simply put the process of how disciples are made. Now, again, I understand this is so fundamental, nobody should be missing it. But that is the process of converting or making additional Christians. We go out and we teach, we get them to have an understanding, they obey, they submit to simply obeying the gospel, and they become Christians. Now, again, I know that's fundamental, but we need to make this clear. Because you've got people who think they're going to heaven and they're not, they're not followers of Christ. And so let's make this very clear to start off with. What does Jesus require? He requires everybody everywhere to become a disciple. It's up to each of us to, to understand that and then to follow through. Now with that being said, I can show you in verses where it's required for everyone to be a disciple, but you may be saying, well, what's really required to be a disciple? That's a good question. Uh, let's break it down first by looking at the definition for the word disciple. Here's the definition, and it's actually what we find in the Scriptures. It's one who engages in learning through instruction from another. Sometimes it's rendered as the word pupil. Sometimes it's rendered as the word student. And normally when we think of those words, we think of somebody kind of today in a classroom just learning. That word also could be rendered as someone who is an apprentice. When we think of that word, we normally think of somebody who is not only learning, but they're also combining the learning with the doing portion. That's starting to get us on the right track, because what we understand is, is that a true disciple who has been fully instructed, fully understands, and will fully carry out is going to be just like the teacher, the master. That's why Christianity today should be exactly like Christianity back then. And what I mean is, is the foundational teachings, certainly they didn't have PowerPoint, but the foundational doctrinal teachings shouldn't have changed. Listen to Luke 6.40, the words of Jesus. It says, The disciple is not above the master, but everyone that is perfect, that word means complete in the King James, shall be as his master. Right? For those of us who claim to be Christians, we can't go around and act the complete opposite of Christ and then yet say we are stewards or servants of Christ. We take those teachings and we act just like the one that we submit ourselves to. It's logical and it's biblical. It's why we as Christians are different than everyone else in the world. It's why we make the best employees. It's why we make the best spouses. And so we need to have this understanding. Now further, as we begin to look at being a disciple, it's carried over in a number of areas. Go ahead and turn over to John 8:31. Because biblical discipleship requires a number of things. I can't cover them all, but it certainly and foremost is abiding in Jesus' words. 
And then we'll understand that being a disciple means that really we're going to love one another. Being a disciple means that we're going to bear fruit. John 8, 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are you My disciples indeed. And we can look at some more passages that talk and focus on being obedient unto the words of Christ. You have many people today who will say they're, they're disciples, and yet in no way are they continuing in His Word. They're going above and beyond and doing things that really they ought not or have not the authority to do. And let me say this, because again, a lot of people talk about being disciples of Christ. Let's go back and use a little bit of logic. When we were all in school, and if someone asked us if we were a student or a pupil, we could honestly say yes. But ask yourself, or go back and remember, how many of you guys had people in school that just quit? You'll hear people say, well, once you become a Christian, you can never fall away, you can never leave. Guys, we know that's not logical and it's not biblical, and I can give you verses. But just as we had people in school who decided to no longer be pupils or disciples, you've got people who were Christians at one time, and they said, you know what? I no longer want to live this way. I'm no longer going to follow those teachings, which we've already shown is how how we prove that we're disciples, and they've walked away from it. John 13, 35, what else is required of Christians as disciples? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. What does that really mean? I'm going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I've had people say, you know, specifically when I'm talking about something they may disagree with, uh, and I'll say, well, the Bible doesn't condone that. And they'll say, well, you're a very unloving person. Let me just give you an example. I'll, I'll just use those ones that people don't like to talk about. Uh, w- when you're dealing with people, let's say, for example, who are in unscriptural marriages, they're living in homosexual lifestyles. Let's just say a guy's got a problem with alcoholism, drug abuse, whatever it may be. And just as much as I love my brothers and sisters in Christ and I want them to go to heaven, I want all those people to go to heaven too. It doesn't mean that I don't like them when I tell them the Bible says that this is forbidden, that you're not allowed to do this and, and live a, a lifestyle that's acceptable unto God. That doesn't mean that I don't love them. It means actually that I love them so much I want them to quit, come into alignment with His Word so that they can go to heaven with us, right? And so the love that we have for our brothers and sisters in Christ is the same love that we have for everybody else around us. We want them to become Christians, faithful Christians, and be on that path to go to heaven. John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. If we're going to be disciples, we're going to be, we're going to be bearing fruit. That is, that is the actions being carried out because of our faith and our understanding of what is expected of us as Christians. Let's look at something else here as we talk about being a disciple. Being a disciple is not easy, guys. I've heard people say, you're, you're a Christian, you believe in God and Jesus because it's a crutch. Guys, there's nothing further from the truth. And if they want to believe that, they can. But let them try to actually live the faithful Christian lifestyle for a while and see if they still feel that way. Because being a disciple requires us to deny self and a willingness to forsake all. All of it. And you may say, how much is all of it? All of it. Listen to Luke 14, 26. And we could use a number of verses, but I'll focus in on two. It says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, the King James didn't do the best job rendering that word hate. That word actually should be rendered as love less. Love less, love less than what? Well, than Christ. And so as we begin to go back here and, and look at what Jesus is trying to get us to understand as disciples, ask yourself this. How many of you guys are willing to forsake family? if you have to, to be faithful? How many of you guys are willing to have family turn their back on you? I grew up in a religious group. I grew up as a Catholic. I came to the point where I read my Bible and stuff wasn't true. And and even though I have family members who are still all uh, Catholic and and I have to deal with uh, the the questions and a, a little bit of being upset, how many of you will walk away from those things that you know are holding you back from being a faithful Christian? I'm just a Christian. I'm not anything now. Same as you. You guys are just Christians. We don't segregate ourselves. Those who oftentimes have left man-made religions, they get disowned. They get um, pushed away from their family. And Jesus says, and he makes it, guys, as clear as can be, if you are not willing to walk away from those people and those things uh, to follow after me, you're not worthy. I'm not saying you don't ever talk to your family again, but I'm saying you realize that 
there's something else that's more important. He goes on in verse 33 there of the same chapter. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Guys, we know all too well that most of the things that we have are just things of this earth. We're not going to take them with us. They're just physical things. But would you be willing to give up virtually everything that you have to help somebody else or to make sure that those things don't become a priority over you following Jesus? Many people are not, but we should. And so before I move on, ask yourself, have you made the necessary commitment to really understand and to follow out and to be a disciple of Christ? And I was talking to a guy the other day at my secular workplace and uh, it was, of course, I always bring up Christianity, and I can do it quite often. And he said, of course I'm a Christian. Can't you tell? And the way that I was supposed to know that was he had a cross on his neck. But it's interesting that oftentimes those people are using foul language, involved in things they should never be involved in. And I want to say there's more than a necklace required for you to be a disciple of Christ. But guys, they just don't know it, and so it's up to us to teach it. How about this? The command for those to believe and to be baptized. What's Jesus require of us? It's funny, I have people talk to me a lot about this, and people will bring up the one and get angry about the other. So let's just spend a little bit of time on it, and we'll move on. And again, let's use the logic. Let's use a little bit of Bible. And we're going to talk about that word belief first. Now, I know this. Certainly, believing in Jesus Christ as the Messiah is probably one of the most basic foundational teachings that we could ever probably have. Uh, and I don't personally know anybody who claims to be a Christian who wouldn't say you need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the prophesied one, the one that actually came as God in the flesh and died on the cross so that all men would have the opportunity to have their sins forgiven. I don't know anybody personally. Well, I, let me take that back. Let me pause. I do know one group that comes and knocks on my door, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They deny that. Uh, but for the most part, I don't know people that would deny that. And again, I'm not trying to be offensive, but most people, they think belief is necessary. And guess what? They're right, guys. It's foundational. Listen to John 3, 16. It's recorded here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, it's funny. People all know that verse. Have you gone back and asked yourself, or have most people who read this verse gone back and asked themselves, when it says that they need to believe in him, what, what are they really believing? They're believing he was Jesus Christ, the prophesied one. They're believing that he came and he established his church, like he said he would in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, the one church, the only church they knew of in the first century. They believe that he died on a cross and shed his blood so that men's sins could be forgiven. That's what they believe. People like to talk about belief but they don't actually cover the entirety of the New Testament. It's kind of like picking up a book from Stephen King and reading one thing and then forgetting the rest of the book. It all goes together, and so does our New Testament. Look at belief in John 8, 24. Same question they need to ask themselves. I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. What are they supposed to believe that he is he? You remember when he said, I am? Same thing that God told Moses to go tell Pharaoh when he says, who, who, who do I tell him sent me? And he said, you tell him I am. And that's what Christ said. And here he says, if you believe not that I am, I am, I am he. Who? I am God in the flesh. I am the prophesied Messiah. I am the one that is declared unto everyone today in the New Testament. That's who we're talking about. The same one that said he would come and build his church. He would establish his kingdom and that there would be Jews standing right there that day who would see it come into existence. That's what they're believing, okay? John 20, 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. You guys ever wonder why he did all the miracles? But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that word Christos, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. I believe he was the Christ. I believe he was prophesied of. I believe he came and established his church like he said he would there. That's what we're believing. And I don't know anybody who claims to be a Christian who would say you don't need to believe. They may not believe some of the foundational things I just mentioned, but they would say you need to believe. And although I think few would argue that belief is not necessary, you find a lot today where as soon as you bring up immersion, 
That is the correct word there for baptism. Baptism, I was taught as a Catholic, was sprinkling. Uh, my uncle, who was a priest, that's what he did. That's what everyone had done to them. But the word baptizo simply means to immerse, to submerge. Again, that's what the word actually means. It was transliterated. When you start to talk about baptism, people either reject the idea of it in part or in whole, and some in part might say, well, I think you need to be immersed, but it doesn't matter whether you're sprinkled, poured, whatever. Guys, let's, let's just go back and look at what the Bible teaches. Again, because we're talking, what does Jesus require of us? Listen to Acts 2.38. This is the very first sermon preached before the church was established on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I read that quite a bit to people, or quote it actually, and they'll say, Those aren't the words of Jesus. No, they're not. But it's Peter who is quoting the commands that we already looked at there in Matthew 28, 19 and 20 to go out and to teach and to baptize. This is Peter recommanding the commands already given by Christ, okay? And therefore, Peter is simply reteaching what was exactly taught by Christ already. We looked at it in Matthew 28. You can go to Mark 16, 15, and 16, where Jesus makes the same command, and nobody disputes that. You can't get around it. Why do people argue about it? I don't know. And I could give you another bunch right off the top of my head. Since I didn't put them in my notes, let me just give you a few here. Go ahead and write down 1 Peter 3, 21. Uh, where it says, uh, baptism doth also now save us. Guys, anytime there's a, the word saved in a verse and it says something's required, guess what's required to be saved? What's in the verse? 1 Peter 3, 21. Go ahead and add Galatians 3, 26 and 27, which talks about us getting into Christ through baptism. And I could give you a bunch more, but we'll just stop there. Now I'm going to move on over to Acts 10 as we're talking about what's required of, of all men. And I'm going to go to the first uh, account there with the Gentile converts. Notice this. It says, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. That's Peter again commanding them to be baptized. And someone again will say, well, it's not Jesus' words. Well, but Peter was told that by Jesus. And here he is recommanding what he was commanded by Christ himself to do. Listen to Acts 22.16. This is what Paul, who became an apostle, was told. And now, why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Again, pretty simple commandments. What does Jesus require of you? Well, certainly to believe, and certainly to obey the gospel, of which baptism is just one part. Now, with that being said, let's focus in on something else. What's it mean really to believe and to be baptized? I say that because I come into contact a lot of time with people, and we'll begin to talk, and they'll say, Oh, yeah, yeah, I was baptized some years ago. And, uh, and certainly this isn't in your notes, but uh, go ahead right here under this section, what it means to believe and be baptized. Go ahead and write down uh, Acts 19, verses 1 through 6, because there you have a conversion account of people who were taught wrong. They were taught John's baptism, which wasn't in existence. Paul taught them correctly, and they got immersed scripturally. And I say all that to say this, as we talk about what's it mean to believe and be baptized, you can't be taught wrong and then baptized correct. Let me say that again. I can't have somebody teach me a bunch of wrong stuff and not know that Jesus established a church, not know that his blood uh, is what cleanses sins, and, and go on and on and on, and then think that just because somebody got me wet in a bunch of water, I'm good. That's why the, the heavy focus on teach and to go out and to learn. Now, I'm going to go to John 1, verse 29. What's it really mean to believe and to be baptized? Well, it means to place my faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, that he is a member of the Godhead, that he is in a position of authority, that it was prophesied that he would come, that he would shed his blood, that that, that that blood would actually give atonement for sins, and that I need to come into contact with the blood. Okay, That's what I need to believe. And listen to John 1.29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Many people, they miss everything that's included in that passage. What did they use lambs for under the Old Testament? The Jews used them to atone for sins, right? They sacrificed the lamb to atone for sins. John the, John the Baptist says, here comes the Lamb of God. And most people probably would have missed it, but that's the one who will be sacrificed to once and for all atone for sins. And so certainly, yes, I need to believe that that's who Christ was. 
but then I need to be immersed with that understanding, okay? Biblical faith, again, place my faith in God, and then I believe that in baptism, He's going to raise me together with Christ, having forgiven me of my sins at that point, and that I am a new creation. Now, again, most people say, well, as soon as you say or think in your mind that you're a believer of God, that's, you're good. Well, again, I want you to remember in Acts 2.38, Peter told them to uh, repent and be immersed in water. Why? For the remission of sins. And that's where in the water, again, nothing special in the water, it's, it's our being obedient, that's where there's a cutting off taking place. Listen to Colossians 2, 11 through 13. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Let me pause for a minute. A circumcision made without hands? Well, we know what a circumcision is, right? It's a cutting off. How do you do a circumcision without hands? He says, in putting off the body of the sins, we're cutting off the sin, sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. That sounds amazing as a Christian. How do I do that? He goes on, verse 12, Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism. Let me pause. So when Peter said, I'm immersed in water for the remission of sins, that's where the sins are cut off? Yes, that's exactly what's going on. He says, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. How many of you have ever heard people say, you know, you don't have to get baptized because that's a work of man. That's not what that just said. Let me read it again. Buried with him in baptism, where also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation. That word there, uh, I didn't look it back up, but ergos, ergos, operation of God. It's the work of God taking place. You're submitting to baptism. He's the one doing the circumcision made without hands, the cutting off, the remission of sins. Peter's talking about in Acts chapter 2. It's so simple that we, we should get it, but people don't. And he says, and you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, that word in the King James, he's made you alive. And it all takes place in baptism. He says, together with him, having forgiven you of all your trespasses. You go down in the water, you were a rank sinner, you come back up, that's when you're added to the church. I'll give you that verse, so Acts 2, verse 47. But the sins were taken away. It's a circumcision made without hands. It's the cutting off of the sins of the flesh. Peter calls it uh, baptism for the forgiveness of sin, or remission of sins. And you come up and you're a new creation, right? I went down and I had done all these things. Maybe I was a drug addict. Maybe I'd killed people. Maybe I'd done whatever. But when I come up, that's all gone. I have a clean slate. Guess what I am now, guys? I'm a Christian. I'm just a new creation. And I can walk without that baggage on me, and I can know I stand right in God's sight. Now, again, there's no cutting off of sin without baptism. There is no rising up to be with Christ without baptism. It's not an operation of man. Verse 12, this is the operation of God as he is cutting away that sin. It's when we're quickened or it's made alive, when we're made alive together with him. And again, you may say, when and where? Go over to Romans 6, verses 3. I'm going to read down to verse 7. I normally just quote verses 3 and 4, but let's follow along. When and where does all this take place? How do I access the blood that we just talked about earlier from the Lamb that allows my sins to be forgiven? Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? He goes on. Therefore, we are buried with Him. Guys, when we're talking about baptism, sprinkling and pouring doesn't bury you, does it? But being immersed all the way in water, that is, that is uh, redoing or simulating the death of Christ. Complete, completely buried, covered in water, okay? He says, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. This is that new creation we're talking about. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, right? He says, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. We kill off the old man when we go under, when we're immersed. We come up, we're resurrected up out of that water, new creations in Christ, knowing that if we live faithful and when we die, just like Christ was resurrected and went to heaven, we also will be too. And we can look at a whole lot more verses, but it's simple. We should just get it. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, right? I'm not going to do those things anymore. That got killed off when I became a Christian. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Remember, we already talked a little bit about being disciples. 
That's when you become a disciple. That's when you choose. Go on over to uh, Acts chapter 8. We'll talk very briefly about the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Because again, people talk about belief. They talk about um, baptism. Some believe it's necessary, some don't. And uh, just to give you a real quick synopsis, if you're not familiar with Acts 8, he's reading from Isaiah 53. Uh, and so I'll just give you that real quick. And I, Philip shows up here, Acts 8, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and he began at the same scripture. That was Isaiah 53. And he preached unto him Jesus. What does preaching Jesus mean? And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, now check this out. He got this from hearing Jesus preached unto him. He said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Somehow he got that from being preached by Philip uh, about Jesus. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So wait a minute. You want to be immersed? Well, if you believe, you can. Uh, for all those people who immerse babies, sprinkle babies. The Ethiopian eunuch wasn't told that by Philip the evangelist. He wants to be immersed, but he says you've got to believe. Okay? We've already covered a little bit about that, and people won't deny it. And... Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he immersed him. They used the word baptize, right? If they were going to sprinkle or pour, they wouldn't have had to go down there. Very clearly, guys, I'm not going to use any more verses. Certainly you need to believe. There's a lot you need to believe. You need to understand. Uh, and obedience to the gospel is finally culminated in that act there of... Uh, Immersion. You find it in every conversion account. How about repentance of sin? That's commanded for those of us to be disciples of Christ or to become disciples of Christ. So this applies to the non-believer, but it also applies to the uh, Christian in order to be faithful. Go to Luke 24, 46 through 47. I'll speed up just a little bit and move through some of my notes. I got notes all over the place. Luke 24, 46 through 47. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Notice this. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Let me pause for just a minute. You can't preach remission of sins without preaching baptism. Acts 2, 38, he says to be baptized for the remission of sins. Jesus actually shed his blood for the remission of sins. Uh, Matthew uh, 26, 28, by memory. All right, there you go. So he goes on and he says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, notice this, among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Remember, I said there was a command to go out and create disciples. It's commanded for all men everywhere. And so, as we begin to talk about repentance of sin, this command was given by Christ to repent over and over and over and over again. Listen to Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what he's teaching the Jews that were there in the crowd. Luke 13, 3. I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Again, he's telling the Jews in the crowd, also repeated in Luke 13, 5. The command was also given by his apostles uh, and those who were out teaching as they, filled the, as they fulfilled the commission. Listen to uh, Peter here, the very first... Uh, as we go past the, the very first sermon, he says it in Acts chapter 2, but when you get to Acts 3, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the, from the presence of the Lord. That's to a Jew. Now listen to Acts 17, 30, and 31. This is actually to uh, the Gentiles there at Mars Hill by, by Paul. Notice again. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth, check this out, all men everywhere... This is in the Jewish crowd. To repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Let me summarize it, and I'll move on. You need to repent of your sins because you're going to be judged. And for those that are here, I didn't write it down. Go ahead and write down uh, John 12, 48. All men will be judged by the word of God. So when you fall short of that word, you need to repent of it. Okay? Now, with that being said, I don't need to go any further. It's commanded and it's required for both the non-believer to uh, repent as part of obeying the gospel, but it's also required for the believer. But what exactly does it mean to repent? Well, we have a little bit of a messed up view. Not a, let me say this. It's, it's a non-biblical view of repentance. Uh, repentance really is to change one's mind. It is to change my way of life because I have an understanding that I have fallen short somewhere regarding 
the will of God. So it's not just going out and saying, man, that made me feel bad. That's not repentance. It's not just me saying sorry to appease somebody else. That's not repentance. Go ahead and go over to 2 Corinthians 7. I'm going to read verses 9 and 10, and then we'll read 11, and then I'll move on to the next point. Repentance is always a decision prompted by godly sorrow, right? I know that I did something uh, that I was not supposed to do that was opposite of God's will required of me, and so now I'm going to recompense for that. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. Now I rejoice now that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Sorry, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing... Notice this, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You may say, what's the difference? Godly sorrow means I know what God expected me to do. I didn't do it, and so I'm sorrowful for that. I'm going to not do it anymore. I'm going to say, I'm going to pray for forgiveness, and I'm going to move on, and I'm, I'm going to be living as I should be. Worldly sorrow is the guy who knocks over his eighth liquor store, goes up in front of the judge, and goes, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry I did that again. That's, that's worldly sorrow, right? He goes on in verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. How many of you guys, when you've messed up and had to pray for forgiveness, went, I'm going to be more careful next time and not do that? That's what he means. What clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation. You ever felt bad? I mean, literally felt bad, had indignation at things you had done that you've had to repent of. You didn't want to do that again. Yea, what fear? You got reverence for God, knowing you shouldn't be doing something. Fear for God. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Guys, we're all going to mess up. Romans 3, 23. The consequence for that sin that all men have taken part in is death. But guys, we can be clear in the matter. When we've repented of it, turned from it, and again been faithful. Christ commands, and that's our next point, faithfulness. How many of you ever heard somebody say, it doesn't matter what you do as a Christian, you can simply, you know, I mean, you can go out and do whatever you want as long as you believe Jesus uh, was the Christ. Guys, we don't find that anywhere. We don't find that in the Bible. Go to Luke 8, 13. Let's talk about faithfulness. Here we find Jesus' words, They on the rocks are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root. It says, which for a while believe. And in time of temptation, fall away. Notice that, guys. Circle that in your Bible if you can. Those people fell away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. How many of you guys ever known someone who became a Christian, but they ended up going back to the world because they, they loved it too much or they were choked with the cares and the pleasures of that world? It happens. Jesus knew it would happen, and so he warns us that there are people who are going to willingly fall away. They're going to choose to fall away. And so continued faithfulness is commanded, or it's required, because people can actually have hearts of unbelief. And guys, I want you to understand this next passage I'm going to read, Hebrews 3, 12. This is talking about us. It's talking about Christians. Take heed, brethren. He's talking to his brethren, Christians. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called the day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. What he's saying is you need to be faithful. Very clearly, you need to be faithful. All right, let me slide down to another passage here. As we talk about being faithful, you may say, well, what exactly does it mean? Let me just give you a couple of passages. Revelation 2, 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. If I'm going to be faithful, I'm not going to leave my first love. Christ is my first love. I'm not going to leave him. The Christian is also required to reject all of those false doctrines. We see a good example of false doctrines in Pergamos. Listen to Revelation 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Well, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this, but in this congregation you had people that held false doctrines. It'd be the equivalent today of people that hold the doctrine of 8070 doctrine, uh, the doctrine of once saved, always saved, the doctrine of 
of uh, whatever it is you want to give, right? Christians have to oppose and reject false doctrine, and we have to stay zealous. Listen to Revelation uh, 3, verse 15 and 16, and then I'll, I'm going to wrap up with one more thing. Revelation verse 3, 15 and 16. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. What's required of a Christian? To be zealous, to be faithful. Now that takes us back then to this understanding of the command for continual repentance. You may be saying, why did you bring that up? Well, when we talked about repentance initially, I was really focusing on those who are going to obey the gospel. Certainly from Christ, we understand there is a need for continual repentance. I'm not going to read all the passages, but I'm going to cite them. Revelation 2, verse 5, he tells them, except thou repent. Revelation 2, 16, he says, repent or else. Revelation 3, 3, he says that they need to uh, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Revelation 3, 19, he says, repent. The idea is for us as Christians, when we fall short, and we talked about it this morning. We expect the grace of God, but what's required is continual repentance. You can go down and you see this expressed by Paul, who was writing to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 12, 20 and 21. And he actually goes on. Let me just quickly read part of that passage. He says, And that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, notice this, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. It's a dangerous thing to leave this world and not have repented of sins. Again, what does it mean to repent? We've already described it. It means that we are to turn from it and to be faithful. For the Christian, it's a little different than the non-Christian because we understand that it also includes prayer and confessing one's sins. Acts 8, 22. He says, Repent therefore of thy wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may, forgive, thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And then in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't really need to go back and give an invitation this morning pertaining to step by step, but I do want to say this. We have really come full circle in the study this morning. We could break it down like this. Jesus wants every single person to become a disciple and to be faithful. And that's really what we need to understand. And so ask yourself this as we start to draw this to a close. Have you done what Jesus requires of you as a disciple? If you're here and you have not obeyed the gospel, the answer is no, you have not. If you're here and you are a Christian, have you been faithful? Let me say one more time before I quit, even though I covered a lot of it already. If you're here and you are not a Christian, you need to believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He came and He established His one church, which is governed by His doctrine, the New Testament. If you believe that and you understand why He came and you understand the consequences of your sin, have you repented? Have you confessed Him and have you been immersed in water? Again, if you haven't done that, you can't be added to the church. We, as we look at what is required of us as Christians, need to understand this. Surely the salvation of our souls requires us to obey the gospel and simply put after that, be faithful. I pray you have a better understanding of what it is that God requires of us. If you have need in any way, you can come forward as Brother John leads us in a song of invitation.